Uh, good morning, students, or should I say almost afternoon. Today is March 11th, 2021, and this is a short uh, synopsis of 1900 to 1920. Uh, I'm not going to cover the Roaring Twenties in any of these lectures because I believe that it is, uh, uh, I'm not going to say it's overrated, but there's, there's plenty of material out there for students to uh, use to uh, study the uh, uh, Roaring Twenties, you know, it's, it's out there, there's plenty of videos, there's plenty of uh, documentaries, uh, and of course there's, uh, there's a, a bunch of reading material. So this one will basically cover uh, World War I and the reasons for World War I, okay? Uh, the strange thing about covering World War I in U.S. history classes is, is that the United States was not involved in World War I until pretty much the last year and a half. They weren't directly involved until the last year and a half, uh, basically after the sinking of the Lusitania. Uh, and that didn't even do it. We have the Zimmerman telegram, and then we have the sinking of the Lusitania. Uh, but really what's going to do it, what, what's really going to get the United States involved in World War I, it's going to be the fall of Tsar Nicholas um, and the installation of the uh, 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 Bolshevik government, you know, uh, and that's going to prompt Wilson to feel that as soon as uh, they, uh, as soon as the Tsar's government uh, falls, then what's going to happen is that uh, the new government in Russia is going to sue for peace uh, with Germany, and Wilson was afraid that the Russians would uh, team up with Germans, and uh, they uh, then would uh, win the war in Europe, and then you would then have the spread of, at that time, Leninism, and later on, communism in uh, Europe, and that's what really gets Wilson uh, anteed up to get involved in the war, okay? Now, with that said, uh, the uh, facilitation or the involvement of the United States in World War I is going to greatly accelerate uh, the ending of the war. Uh, I believe that uh, U.S. American troops were arriving in Europe at a rate of approximately 100,000 a month. Um, I don't remember the exact troop deployment. Uh, that the United States had in World War I. There is a video within this unit that uh, is called Reasons of World War I that goes over that very, very well at the very end, and I really strongly suggest that you do that. So there's reasons why the United States gets involved in World War I, and then there's reasons why Europe gets involved in World War I, and we're going to tackle Europe first, because if we don't fully understand why Europe gets involved in World War I, then, of course, we're not going to understand why the United States gets involved in World War I. And um, with that said, and I, that's, that seems to be one of my catchphrases, like, okay, uh, what we have here in Europe is that we do not have a system of established... We have nation states, but they're not democratically, fully democratically governed. They're still, you know, kingships, and they're still, you know, an emperor in Austria-Hungary, and they're still a, you know, emperor in Germany. So there is a type of pseudo democracy, and at this time there exists a somewhat of a feudal system. Now the other thing that exists is that you you I strongly recommend that you look at a map before World War One and then you look at a map after World War One, and if you look at those maps and you see the carving up of Europe after World War One, you will better understand why there's so many problems in the Balkans or why there was so many problems in the Balkans you know, in the areas of Yugoslavia and uh, Croatia and Bosnia, uh, those areas were literally carved up. The, the problem that occurs when you carve these countries up, you know, when you have, you know, when you divide 
uh, Austria, create Austria, Hungary, and you know possibly remove the Sudetenland from Germany and create Czechoslovakia, and then you come, you know, you have Poland. That first and foremost, a lot of these lines were not drawn via ethnic lines. They were just drawn on the map. So you could have ethnic groups that were majorities uh, in an area, and then when they demarcated or they made new lines, then those majorities became minorities, and the majorities in that then country would prey upon them. And that's how you get a lot of ethnic issues. And later on, you're going to have not only political and ethnic ideologies class, but you're also going to have religious ideology class. So you're going to have political, you're going to have just plain ethnics, and then you're going to have, you know, religious within the ethnic. And that is a combination for uh, uh, volatility. I think, I hope I said that right, right? A very volatile situation. The other thing that happens here is an alliance system, okay? And... And there's also at this time between, you know, right around 1870 to World War One, you have Europe really, especially the British, going out and carving out an empire uh, in the world. I mean, it is, it is not erroneous to say that by the time that World War I occurs, Great Britain controls about 25% of the globe. So other countries wanted to get into the soiree. You know, you have the French that wanted to do it, the Germans wanted to do it. Uh, other countries like Spain, of course, Spain loses its empire to the United States when the United States decides that it's going to get involved in its, you know, uh, quest for an empire for coaling stations, refueling stations, and markets for its products, and then, of course, for a good source of raw materials. Uh, so imperialism does make things very tense, and it makes some countries more jealous than others. You know, I want what they have. I want cheap labor, and I want to gather raw materials. The main target at this time for all of this uh, uh, pillaging or raw source material pillaging was, of course, Africa and India, okay? Uh, you know, the British are also involved in Latin America, uh, primarily in Mexico. You have the Germans that are heavily, heavily entrenched in Latin America. The French first start to try and build the Panama Canal, and they're unsuccessful. And then the United States under Theodore Roosevelt, you know, overtakes that venture. You know, the Germans are in Venezuela, and Theodore Roosevelt also threatens to go to war with them. So this is the age of the battleship. This is the age of the big, you know, navy, the great white fleet. And this is going to create problems. I mean, when you have a bunch of countries gallivanting in the seas with these huge battle uh, ships, you know, uh, you're taunting each other. You know, it, it creates an arms race, and it's not good. We're going to see an arms race like this during the Cold War between Russia and the United States in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. I attended a lecture some years back and one of the questions that I asked one of the speakers who was a former Soviet uh, uh, rocket scientist, I said, why were you guys producing so many weapons and why were you creating bombs like the Tsar Bomba and all these other things? And he said, we were terrified of you guys. You guys were doing the same thing. So if you guys exploded a 50 megaton bomb, then we had to explode a 100 megaton bomb to demonstrate to you all that, you know, we were going to be able to defend ourselves. And in a sense, it's, it's going to create an arms race. Basically, what you have here is that you have a peeing contest between two countries 
with either battleships or artillery pieces or of course nuclear weapons. The other thing that's going to that's going to plague this issue is an alliance system. It's kind of like you telling your buddy, "Hey man, do you have my back? If I get in a fight, are you going to help me?" And and of course, maybe you do the secret handshake or whatever and he says, "Yeah." That individual may have nothing to do with what you got involved in, but he has committed himself. And in the, in the here is is that we're going to have countries like Serbia that are really small that feel threatened by Austria-Hungary that are going to ally themselves with the Russians. And they say, if anybody attacks Serbia, we the Russians are going to come and defend you. And Austria-Hungary is going to tell Germany, well, since they made that alliance, will you guys defend us if somebody comes to do that? And they say yes. And then Russia makes a deal with with France and says, hey, if anybody attacks us, will you help us out too? And they say, yeah, we'll do that. And then Belgium, who gets caught in the middle of Germany and France, says, hey, well, uh, England, if anything happens or if anybody attacks us, will you guys help us out? And they say, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll do that. So basically what's going to happen is that Archduke Ferdinand, which is going to be the physical catalyst that's going to start World War I, is going to get assassinated by a Bakunin anarchist named Garvilo Princip in Sarajevo, and they're going to say, you guys didn't do enough to thwart this 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 assassination attempt, so now we're going to attack you. So when Austria-Hungary attacks Serbia, then Russia comes to the aid of Serbia and attacks Austria-Hungary. When Russia attacks Austria-Hungary, then Germany attacks Russia because they have a deal with Austria-Hungary, right? And then, because they're involved, then the French say, well, we made a promise that we would help you guys, if you know, the Russians, if you got involved. So then the French get involved. And then, when the Germans decide to attack France, instead of just crossing their border, they go through Belgium, because in Belgium they have really good roads. They violate Belgium neutrality, and the English declare war on uh, Germany and Austria-Hungary, and that is how a world war starts, because you have this piggyback alliance system that in many ways it is made to prevent a war because you've created a super block of countries, and what you're really going to create is a quagmire of death and destruction as seen in, like it's never seen before, okay? The other thing is nationalism and the lack of diplomacy, not just from the Germans, but from everybody in the picture. Okay, let me tell you something. Negotiation in the art of diplomacy is an art, okay? Even if you use fear to get what you want, right? Because, I mean, I don't recommend that you use fear because that would be intimidation, but fear only works if you're able to trick your adversary into thinking that they're vulnerable and you can conquer them. So it's a mind game, right? But at this time, there was no negotiation. There was no diplomacy whatsoever. There was nothing that said, hey, let's talk about this. Everybody thought their country was the best. They promoted their national interest, and they had no, no... Uh, uh, intention to sit down and negotiate. Austria-Hungary felt that everybody was trying to encircle them and take them over. Germany thought the same thing. Of course, Belgium was attacked. They were neutral. They had no iron in the fire and just by their neutrality get involved. And then the British feel the need to do that. And then, of course, Serbia told the Archduke you know, don't come to Sarajevo. We have information that says that there are people out here that want to kill you. And what does uh, Franz Ferdinand say? Oh, no, nobody would ever do that. Well, what ends up happening is that they end up killing him and his pregnant wife. They wipe out the, the, uh, the bloodline 
completely. You know, he, they kill his wife Sophie and they kill him. And his last words is, "Is Sophie okay?" Something to that effect. Don't quote me on that. So the physical catalyst for Europe is going to be the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. The others are diplomatic catalysts. There's like straws that you're putting on the camel's back, whereas the physical catalyst is going to be the straw that is going to break the camel's back. I don't believe that that was a good enough reason. They caught Garavillo Princip and the others, and they were, they, you know, try them and, you know, put them to death or whatever it may be. But the bottom line is that Austria-Hungary wanted Serbia. That's, that's the real reason, is that they wanted to make a territorial acquisition of Serbia, and the people of Serbia didn't want it. And that that's really why it happens. And and really, the, 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 the leftovers of World War I caused World War II, and it's still, to this day, we we not we, but they fight about it, okay? Now, all of the same reasons happen for the United States. But wait a minute. The United States is doing the same thing. They're disturbing the international equilibrium by having the great white fleet sail around the, you know, around the world. Uh, they're, they're again enforcing the Monroe Doctrine, saying that no European powers can come to uh, Latin America and they reinforce it with a Roosevelt corollary. Uh, there, you've got unrestricted submarine warfare by the Germans, that you have the torpedoing of the Lusitania that has American people in it. The problem is that the Germans knew that the Lusitania was carrying supplies for the war in Europe, and when a neutral ship you is used to provide supplies, and it is considered a hostile ship. You know what I mean? I mean, it's, it's a, it, it, it is what it is. I mean, you may be innocent of the act, right? But if you decide to do something illegal for your friend in your car, even though you're not directly involved with it, then you're culpable. You're, you are going to be held responsible for those things, right? So they really pointed their finger at Germany because they were being an international desperado that was just doing this. It also doesn't help that Germany sends a telegram uh, from the Mexican uh, embassy in Mexico, the German embassy in Mexico, to the Mexican president, Venustiano Carranza, and says, hey, if you allow us to attack the United States from Mexico, we will make sure that you get all of the territory that you lost in World War One. Now, of course, Mexico is really smart. They say, hey, we never got such a telegram. And, of course, the British intercept it. And they hold it for like two months before they give it to the Americans. They wait for just the right time. And they say, okay, now is the right time. Let's give them this message. Hopefully they'll join the war effort. And they don't. They don't. The United States does not join the war effort with the Zimmerman telegram. And the United States does not join World War I after the sinking of the Lusitania. They will do it after the October 7, 1917 revolution when Tsar Nicholas falls. That's, that is when it happens, and that is the beginning of the Cold War. Okay? Now, so... Let's talk about World War I. What separates World War I from all of the other? Well, you've got, you've got a couple of issues here. The first issue is you're, you're still using somewhat of Napoleonic tactics to fight a, a modern war. By this time, most, if not all, countries have smokeless powder. Uh, they have uh, uh, the diameter of the bullets that are being used are smaller, 7 millimeter, 8 millimeter. The British have the 303. Uh, the French have the 7, I think it's the 8 millimeter Lebel. Of course, the Germans have the 8 millimeter, which they had well into World War uh, II. The bullets are copper, you know, it's lead encased in copper, so it's a gliding metal, so you're getting velocities that are going anywhere between 26 to 2,800 feet per second. The distance uh, of these, uh, the, the, 
the the uh, capacity or the distance to create damage uh, is greatly increased. The accuracy of these rifles is so much better. Uh, and then, of course, you're going to have the invention of Hiram Maxim's machine gun. Now, Hiram Maxim was a surgeon during the, the, the late uh, Napoleonic Wars, and he comes up with something better than the Gatling gun. He comes out with the Maxim gun that is capable of firing 600 rounds per minute. It's basically, you know, 10 rounds a second. I, I think my math is correct. I may be wrong, but it's... Uh, or is it... No, that would be 60. Yeah, it's 10 rounds a second. Yeah, so you're, you're looking at, at a machine gun that you can get two or three individuals that could lay down suppressive fire. And it, now he sells this machine gun to Germany, to France, and to England. Okay, later on, the British come out with the Lewis gun. The Americans come out with the Browning. You know, but, you know, I mean, he's an architect of death. And, you know, one, two machine guns can keep, you know, 500 men pinned down. You know, because all he's got to do is set up his tangent site and have just ta 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 It's short taps. Just fire three or four bullets per tap. They were they were water cooled as long as they did not overheat. Everything was okay. You had somebody feeding the the belt. You know, usually the belts came in a can, and you had two hundred rounds. All he had to do was when it was done. Then he would just feed another belt in there. It was a canvas belt. And then pop, 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 Not like you see in the movies where they go. No, it doesn't work like that. It would overheat in maybe a minute. And it wouldn't work anymore. The barrel would warp and all that. You know, a good machine gunner would find out where the people were that he wanted to shoot at. He would raise his tangent sight, get the machine gun, lock the elevation because they had a mechanism where you would lock the elevation but you could still swing it to the side so he had he could cover an area of anywhere between two to four hundred yards just by moving the machine gun on a pivot does that make sense once that elevation was set he said okay those those soldiers are 500 yards away let's uh, delay suppressing light fire and you just sit there and harass them I mean ka -ka 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 -ka, and then as they approach then you would lower your elevation and ka -ka 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 -ka. Uh, maybe I'll put a video on the maxim uh, the only bad thing about the maxim is that it had this this lever that would spin around that would load it and you had to keep your fingers away from it because if it hit your knuckles it would break your it would break your knuckles. I had I was very fortunate when I was in my teens. There was a ranch in San Antonio that was called Garcia's Ranch, and this guy had a huge collection of machine guns. And twice a year, you could go to this place, and you would pay for the ammunition, and you could fire the machine guns. He had them set up, and he would bring in a bunch of old cars. And you could shoot away. And I, back then, fired 200 rounds out of an 8 millimeter uh, uh, German uh, German Maxim. I also got to fire a Lewis gun. I fired quite a few machine guns at that place. But so what this what this leads to is that now men can't fight the way they used to in the Napoleonic Wars. You just can't get up and, you know, rank and file and march against each other because a machine gun will cut everybody down. So that means that you've got to take the war below the surface, okay, because you can't be up in the surface. So you've got trench warfare. Trench warfare is not good, right? You're in the ground. It's wet. You know, Europe is a very wet uh, 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 area. Uh, not a lot of air circulation, tuberculosis, fleas, lice, you know, fungus, believe it or not, something fungus so bad that it was called trench foot that led to the amputation of toes and sometimes feet and legs, sometimes sepsis, people would die from septicemia, okay? Not to mention that then you add on top of the machine gun that is constantly you know, bullets going flying over 
you've got snipers that are firing these copper clad bullets that are very good. These rifles may be old, but they're incredibly accurate. And in the hands of an able human being, you can you can shoot targets easily out to out to 200 yards without a scope and then fitted with telescopic sights you can shoot individuals to 500 yards and this is at this time is is really really uh, something that has never been seen before in addition to that you have the nascent airplane that is more of a psychological because he's coming from above and they're dropping hand grenades and bombs and strafing you know coming down and shooting so and then of course you have uh, modified artillery at this is the time of the bigger the better you know if you look at world war one artillery you have literally you know uh, artillery that is fired that leaves a hole you know the size of anywhere between half an acre to an acre you're moving an incredible amount of dirt and that you also have individuals digging tunnels, putting huge charges of dynamite and detonating them. And of course, we see for the first time, we recognize post-traumatic stress syndrome or what they used to call back then shell shock, okay? Now, I can go on and on and on. You know, you have to talk about poison gas. You can talk about all these other things, but you know, it's, it's amazing how individuals or human beings are always looking for more efficient ways to kill each other in larger more wholesale numbers and they always sugarcoat it in the uh a way of doing it humanely you know what i mean does it does it make it the americans end up putting 2.8 million men into service about 48,000 get killed uh, about 230 are wounded, um, and that is a lot for the little time that we were there, okay? In addition to that, we will see the domestic problems brought on by the war. Well, what are we going to see as far as domestic problems? Well, you're going to have the Committee of Public Information, which is led by George Creel, an outspoken progressive journalist. Uh, it includes patriotic recruiting techniques, newspaper, film, posters, a system of voluntary censorship, you know, like a bunch of rats, you know, uh, you know, uh, anti-German sentiment, you know, people don't call sauerkraut sauerkraut anymore. They call it liberty cabbage. People stop listening to Bach and Brahms and Beethoven. Vigilante among German Americans spreads at an alarming rate when Germans are singled out and killed just for simply being Germans. We're going to see this during World War II with the Japanese. Ironically, we're not going to see it that much with the Germans during World War II, but we're going to see it with the uh, Japanese. Uh, you're going to have the passing or the reinstallation of the Espionage and Sedition Act. These have been around since the Adams administration, the second president. And these are going to be used not to single out individuals that are speaking out against the war or be disloyal. They are going to target those individuals. But they're also going to target communists and anarchists like Ricardo Flores Magón or Eugene Debs, you know. Uh, that that's what's going to have they get Eugene Debs under the Espionage Act and the Espionage Act is that you cannot be disloyal to the United States and the Sedition Act says that you can't protest against the war now eventually you're going to have uh, the fire in a theater case that's gonna you know your freedom of speech however one of the things that a lot of Americans and students don't realize is that we do not have as much freedom of speech as we think we do. Yes, we the freedom of speech is to protect ourselves and to speak out against the government. It's not to call somebody a name. I mean, you can go on Facebook and, you know, say that I'm, you call me a bad name because of my ethnicity, but if you get fired at your job or something that, that's a repercussion of what you said. Your, what you say is not protected by, the consequences of what you say are not protected by your First Amendment. 
your ability to say what you want is okay, but there are repercussions to that. And the reason we call it a Schneck v. United States or fire in a theater is because you cannot go into a theater and yell fire and then somebody gets trampled to death, you're going to be held liable for that. Yes, you are. You, you can go in there and yell fire in a theater. But if somebody gets killed, you're going to get charged. And I can't remember the Supreme Court justice that was the, uh, that wrote the, the major, uh, uh, I forget what it's called. It's been a long morning already. I'm pretty sure I'll remember the, uh, Supreme Court Justice at 2 o'clock in the morning. He's really famous, but I just can't... It's not Frankfurter. It's not Brandeis. Uh, uh, I can't remember his name right now. I think his dad... His, I remember his dad was a, was also a bigwig in, in American politics, but I just cannot remember his name right now. But I, I'm pretty sure I'll remember soon enough, right? By the way, that's good. that case is going to get overturned later on. Oliver Wendell Holmes. That was the guy that said, you know, use the example of fire in a theater. Oliver Wendell Holmes, yeah. Uh, so, uh, anyway. So, it, it the government is always going to use an excuse during wartime to curtail the liberties of Americans because of xenophobia and paranoia or whatever it may be. You know, like I said, they did go after Ricardo Flores Magón, uh, uh, a Mexican anarchist, and he dies in prison, and they go after Eugene Debs, and I'm pretty sure you can find other individuals that they did. Now, what about here? What about what's going on here? We already told you what's going on over there. Well, we also get Bernard Baruch that uh, is overseeing the, the War Industries Board. You have Herbert Hoover who was really good administrator, but then becomes just a bad president. He starts the Food Administration and encourages folks to cut down on their eating, to plant victory gardens at home. They ration and distribute food stuff. They regulate fuel, railroad shipping, foreign trade, the use of telephones, the use of ele electricity, all of these things that that you take for granted, you know, kind of like when we had this big cold spell during COVID, we see the limitation of of, um, of consumables because of hoarding or because people just flat out panic. Labor unions are doing really good. Why? Because the whole country is mobilized in, you know, producing for the war effort. They're making good money. You have a migration of African Americans that are going up north to work in the factories because a lot of Anglo Americans are going to fight in the war. You do have a lot of African Americans that are going to fight. W.B. Du Bois speaks of the new, quote, new Negro, a prouder, more militant African American. Uh, they figure Mexican Americans and African Americans figure, hey, if we go fight in this war, when we come back, they're going to respect us because we went to fight, and it doesn't happen. They also do it do it during World War II, and when they come back and they get lynched, they're made to eat, and you know, uh, they aren't allowed to eat in restaurants. They are not allowed to be uh, have their wakes in. Uh, you know, all white funeral homes, you know, so this systemic racism is not going to go away. You're going to have, while there's a big migration of about half a million African Americans up north, where up north is supposed to be more tolerant than, it, than the south, you do see lynchings and you do see uh, uh, the same type of racism, more economically driven than anything else, but you still have that racism there. A lot of these people that go up there, they form their own communities. You know, you're going to have barrios, you're going to have, you know, a lot of areas that resemble Chinatown, you know, people that live on the other side of the tracks. You know, this is, this is, a, this is, I mean, we're going to cover this later on. But in 1919 alone, about 40 African Americans are killed in race riots throughout the United States, primarily in the area of Chicago and the Great Lakes region. Now, 
what can I tell you about the end of World War II? It was really prolonged uh, uh, war where people kill each other in ho wholesale. Just to give you an idea, the Battle of Verdun lasts nine months, and 300,000 French are killed, wounded, or missing. Now, if you divide that by nine, that's going to give you like 310,000 in the three three hundred and ten thousand individuals that are gonna that are going to uh, no it's, it's three hundred thousand so that's gonna be thirty thousand one or thirty one ah <laughs> you have three hundred thousand Frenchmen that are killed wounded or missing in a nine month period that's gonna translate to a casualty rate of thirty one approximately thirty one thousand two hundred uh, soldiers uh, a month, and now uh, you divide that by by uh, uh, thirty days in a month, then you're looking at a thousand casualties a day. That's just the French, okay? That's why a lot of people criticize the French for sitting out World War II, and it's like we can't do this again. You know, we lost eight million during World War One. We 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 can't lose another eight million. One of the main reasons that Great Britain ceased to be the world power that it was is because they did it twice. They did it once in World War One, and then they did it twice. I believe during World War One they lose about four million, but that's a tiny island, you know, and then you lose another four or five billion. And so that's going to re... Can you imagine all the inventors, all the doctors, all the lawyers, all the teachers that we killed over a senseless war? These individuals were killed at a ripe age of 18, 19, and 20 years of age, you know. There are some age, there are some areas in France that are so full of bodies that they don't do anything with them. They just plant poppies there because there you can't do anything because you're going to dig up bones, okay? So in March of 1917, a war-weary uh, Russians overthrow their czar and pretty much by... October, they're talking about negotiations. Lenin and the uh, the Bolshevik leader immediately begins negotiations for peace. Wilson freaks out, and of course he sends troops over and he starts with his fourteen point plan. Now I really don't want you to know anything about the fourteen point plan other than it doesn't get approved, and even though they approve the League of Nations, the United States doesn't join it. What I do want you to know is that not listening to Wilson, I don't care for Wilson at all, okay? He was a bigot. He's not a nice person. But if we would have listened to Wilson, then we probably wouldn't have had World War II. Wilson felt that there was no reason to put blame on anybody, that the idea here was that we were going to just say, World War I was just a big, big mistake. We're all going to share the blame, and we're going to move on for the sake of humanity. But the big four, Wilson, uh, David Lloyd, you know, uh, uh, David Lloyd George uh, for Great Britain, Georges Clemenceau for France, and Vittorio Orlando for Italy. You know, Italy, they're getting involved when they really shouldn't have gotten involved. They decide that the only re way that they're going to that they're going to agree for peace is is that Germany accepts blame for starting World War One. That the it's called the War Guilt Clause, and that they're going to be forced to pay reparations for all of the damage that they incurred. To other countries and what this is going to do is that it's going to put Germany under an insurmountable amount of debt and they're not going to be able to get out of it and that is going to give rise to individuals like Mussolini it's going to give rise to individuals like Hitler okay disenfranchised dissatisfied individuals that felt that they had been thrown under the bus uh, during World War One, let me tell you something about Hitler. I mean, Hitler was not a coward. He fought bravely in World War One. He was decorated with an Iron Cross. He is gassed. Um, he was a courier. 
So uh, he was he was unhappy. He was uh, uh, disgruntled at the fact that he felt that they had been abandoned, that the German people had been abandoned, and were now at the fate of England, France, and Italy. And and of course, he still said that. You know, I understand why why England and France are pissed off, but you know, Italy, <laughs> you know, they just kind of weasel their way in there you know they, they were involved in the war but you know and because people in Italy were so unhappy that's going to give rise to individuals like Mussolini who Hitler is going to idolize at the beginning it was Hitler that wanted to talk to Mussolini and it was Mussolini that didn't want to have anything to do and then in, in the end it, the tables turned okay so what are the legacies? I just told you the legacies of the Great War. It, it's going to spin off a bunch of other little ethnic and wars. It very, very uh, leaves a lot of unsolved problems. It's going to produce economic and political instability in the area. It's going to make it a breeding ground for, for totalitarianism. Not to mention that then you're going to have inflation. You're going to have labor strikes because... People that are working in the United States still want to make the same amount of money, but you can't. Why? Because you don't have that domestic output anymore. You still need to make payments for the stuff that you bought when you were making all that money during the war, but the work isn't there. It's not that the economy takes a dive. It's just that the economy went above the economic baseline, and it was so incredibly high that they never thought it was going to, like, this is where it was during World War One, but this was actually the normal e economy curve right here. So you start spending this kind of money when you really should be spending not this kind of money, but a little under that. And when you're not making that much money, that's going to lead directly into eventually the uh, stock market crash that we I will talk about that when we talk about the New Deal and that's going to be the next uh, lecture so you've got inflation you've got companies like US Steel complaining with labor conflicts and of course you've got the Red Scare people are looking for communists now Wilson was a Democrat by 1920 people have had enough with Democrats and they elect a competent Republican nominee by the name of Warren G. Harding, who eventually is going to die of a heart attack. And then, you know, Hoover is going to become uh, the president, okay? Uh, is, is it Hoover? Oh, or is it Calvin Coolidge? I, no, I think it's Silent Cal. I'm almost positive it is. It, it is Calvin Coolidge. I'm sorry. It, it, it's, uh, it's not Hoover. All right, and by the way, uh, Harding wins with 60% of the popular vote, which at the time was the largest popular majority up to that date. Now, I'm telling you that I'm not covering the next little spot on the lecture notes, the new era. Uh, I want you to cover that, and uh, it covers the Roaring Twenties, it covers the Model T, it covers the homogenization of you know cultures and heroes in the United States it talked about the alienation of Americans where Americans become shallow and you know greedy uh, it's also going to cover the Harlem Renaissance and the Harlem Renaissance is the uplifting of African Americans where African Americans now begin to search for their own identity their own music their own art their own poetry Langston Hughes, you know, you, you, this is the time when the birth of African American literature and art and, of course, rock and roll begins all at this time. Actually, there's some, you can see some really good uh, videos from the 1960s and 50s that, of uh, music that came up at this time. You also have individuals known as the Flaming Youth, which are going to be, you know, your flappers and your people that go to speakeasies or having sexual activity outside of marriage, you know, and it's all linked to the automobile. The problem is that there's no oral contraceptive. So as long as there's no oral contraceptive, that is going to keep uh, uh, 
promiscuity and wildness at in check to an extent. It's also going to, during this time, we're also going to see a lot of immigration restriction and we're going to see an incredible amount of xenophobia towards Eastern Europeans as we had. And I particularly want you to pay attention to two cases at this time that will be on your exam. Number one, your Sacco and Banzetti case. Okay, that is very important. It, of course, they are accused of murdering a policeman and they're put in the electric chair, but they were not guilty. And the other one is going to be the Scopes trial. You know, and the Scopes trial can be, we can, we can almost relate to the Scopes trial right now because it's it's a fight between Catholics and Protestants, nativism and new immigrants, and the battle between rural and urban America. The Scope Trials is known as the Monkey Trial, where John Scope is accused of violating Tennessee's Butler Act, which made it unlawful to teach evolution in a state-funded school. Okay, so that's very important because that is secular, scientifically based secular thought. Uh, was not a, not allowed in public schools, you know. You know, the, the idea that some people to think that they had come from apes was just a little too much for them to handle. Okay, so, and I think we see a lot of that now. I think, I think not with evolution, but the simple fact that a lot of individuals feel that conservative America is dying a slow death because their freedoms are being infringed upon by more liberal-minded individuals that are more tolerant, you know. I, I, if I, you know, if the evolutionary chain says that I come from an ape, fine, I come from an ape. That doesn't mean I am one, right? Or, you know, I have a couple of friends that will refuse to take a, a genetic test because they're actually afraid that they may have some African-American or Mexican blood in them, and they can't, they can't stand to have that. By the way, I'm not really good friends with them anymore, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, they, and they'll say, well, I'm a Native American. Yeah, but if you're a Native American, you still came from China. So it, it, it's, it's, it, there's some issues there. Uh, we're going to see the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan. Of course, we're going to have prohibition. You know, uh, the Mexican Revolution is going on at this time, you know, 1910 to 1920. You have an influx of Mexicans coming into the United States, fleeing death and destitution. A million Mexicans flee and a million die. And, of course, for the first time in the history of the United States, we see an identifiable gay and lesbian culture begin to emerge around the area of Greenwich Village in New York. Okay, they suddenly begin to say, well, you know what, I'm, I'm gay. Um, significant changes occur for women. Uh, birth control becomes more widely recognized, but it's available among the poor, okay? The 19th Amendment passes and franchise women over the age of 21. That's why voting in this last election for women was so expensive. I mean, uh, hey, not expensive, so important was because the election of 1920-21 was the first, for was the 100-year anniversary of, you know, uh, women being enfranchised. Okay, when we come back, we'll pick up right around 1920, and I'll go over diplomacy of prosperity. You know, the United States being involved in Latin America. You know, and some really uh, uh, cockamamie ideas not to prevent war, like the passing of the 1922 Fordney May Cumber Tariff. I'm uh, not that the Kellogg Bryan Pact of 1929 that renounces war as an instrument of national policy, okay? So anyway, I've gone on. I've been ranting and rattling for almost 50 minutes now. I apologize for not getting this lecture out sooner, but I have had a lot on my plate for the last week. I strongly encourage all of you to listen to these lectures. I've seen that not a lot of you listen to them, but if I'm making the effort to record them for you, then I hope that you are taking the time to listen to them. I want all of you to take care. I want you to please continue to wear your mask until, you know, the federal government tells us that we're done. And I, more importantly, want you to be kind to each other and to stay healthy and sage. Okay? Goodbye, students.